Welcome to Touching the Ozarks, the weekly television broadcast ministry of Ozark Full Gospel Church, featuring the Bible teaching of Pastor James Akins. Thank you for joining us and stay tuned as we get ready to hear another message from God's exciting word. Jesus said, when I die for the world, I'm going to the tomb and I'm going to get up from the grave and I'm going to offer salvation to the whole world. And I want you to know for the Christian, the best is yet to come. Open your Bibles this morning to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're only going to read one verse, and many of you are going to know this verse by heart. You might be able to just recite it from memory, actually. Uh, Just one verse, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and uh, whenever you find that, you can stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Our friends across the pond would refer to this as 2 Timothy chapter 3. But in case you don't understand that, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, and this is what it says, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. I'm going to read that one more time. You can read it with me. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. I've titled the message simply this morning, The Peril of the Last Days, or The Danger of the Last Days. You may be seated. Now, There's really actually five things that I want to talk about in this message this morning, five dangers of being in the last days. But before I can get there, first of all, I've got to uh, establish and lay a little groundwork. So in this chapter, uh, Paul is speaking to Timothy, who's going to continue on in the ministry after he goes to be with the Lord. And he's giving Timothy in the verses that follow this one a grim outline of some of the things that he's going to be facing. And uh, he speaks about the depravity of man and the ever-increasing wickedness that's going to come. He's warning Timothy of what's coming. He's speaking about the last days. We read that in the verse. It says, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Now, as we read this passage, It's almost as if Paul is talking to us. It's almost as if the scriptures are speaking directly to us because, in fact, he is. God has given us these things so that we can know the hour that we're living in. The things that Paul warned about, in fact, are unfolding in our day. Uh, There are many things that are happening in our day. Uh, The world is getting darker, but when things get darker, lights get brighter. And the hope of Jesus Christ's return is getting brighter and brighter and brighter every day, though the darkness seems to be getting darker and darker by the moment. See, the Bible told us that these days would come, and I believe that we truly are living in the last days. Now, when I said that and when I read this, some of you immediately had the question, are we really living in the last days? Maybe you didn't say it out loud, but maybe you had that thought cross your mind, said, well, I've heard this before, and I ask you, don't glaze over this morning. I believe the Lord has something to speak to this congregation and to those listening, uh, however that may be. But the question comes, are we really living in the last days? And the answer is, yes, we are. You don't have to look any further than Scripture itself, in fact, to find out that we are, in fact, living in the last days. So I want to show a few things to you before we move any further in this, because I believe that we're living in the last days, so we're going to go to the Bible, God's Word, to determine that we are, in fact, living in the last days. Are you, are you with me? So let's take, for instance, what it says in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. You'll see it on the screen if you don't have your Bible with you. It says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. He has in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So you see in verse two, notice that it says that God has spoken to us in these what? Last days by who? His son, which is Jesus Christ. Now, 
Through the ages, God has spoken to people at different times in various manners in different ways. And he's spoken to the prophets. Uh, the Old Testament, the pages of Scripture points to God's redemption plan and points to one that would come who is Jesus Christ. We see glimpses and types and shadows of the things that are going to happen. And in the fullness of time, God came in the flesh in a person. His name is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God's son who came in the flesh to this world. And uh, the Bible says that, that God began speaking to us, not just by the scriptures, not just by the, the prophets, but by the fulfillment of the scriptures. The word of God in flesh came and began speaking to us in these last days. Uh, but you know, when, when Jesus came, the Jews, they rejected their Messiah. The, their Messiah, meaning the one that the scriptures talked about, would come. When he showed up, they rejected him. Uh, Ray Comfort often says when he's evangelizing to people, uh, he says the Old Testament promised that God would destroy death, and the New Testament shows us how he did it. See, the Old Testament uh, believers were looking forward to what God would do, here in this church, we're looking back to what God did do. They were expecting one to come, and in our day, he has come, and he has spoken to us. Now, because the Jews rejected their Messiah at the time that he came, you'll sometimes hear people say that God is calling out a Gentile bride, and that simply uh, just means he's calling out a church. We're living in the church age. Those that are born again, have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, are part of that church. And soon God is going to take his church, those born again believers, to heaven to be with him. And when he does, God is going to begin to turn his attention again to his people in Israel. God is not done with his people in Israel. And when that happens, the Antichrist is going to rise to power. He's going to confirm a covenant with Israel for seven years. They're going to go into what is called the Great Tribulation Time, the seven-year period. Ultimately, the Antichrist is going to go into a temple that's built, and he's going to declare himself to be God. He's going to set up an abomination, the Bible says, in the temple and declare himself to be God. Well, at that point, the Jews are going to realize they made a terrible, terrible mistake. That the one that they thought was going to be their Superman, their Savior there, ended up being Satan's Superman. And he's going to begin to persecute them and pursue them, and ultimately that's going to culminate in the battle of the Armageddon, the battle of all battles. And when it looks like all hope is gone... Jesus himself is going to come in great power and in glory and every eye is going to see him and the nations are going to know and Jesus is going to put down the works of the devil, put down the works of the Antichrist. All of the plans are going to be spoiled and Christ is going to set up a kingdom where he's going to rule for a thousand years. That's kind of a nutshell of the overview of what we're looking at in the days ahead. Now here's what I want to say, I said all that to say this, because we're talking about are we living in the last days, and Hebrews says we are living in the last days. Jesus is speaking to us in the last days. And now, I want you to know this, the time between the first coming of Jesus in the manger as a baby, and the second coming of Jesus when every eye is going to see him, is the last days. The time between his first coming and his second coming is a time known as the last days. You follow me so far? I hope I didn't lose anybody. I'm trying to be as clear as I can with this because we, we need to set this we need to set this up. Now, let's look again at what the apostle Peter has to say about this. We're talking again about the last days. Acts chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. You don't have to go with me unless you want. It will be on the screen. Later on, we'll pin down a page and we'll stay there. But right now, Acts chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Listen to what the apostle Peter says. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass when in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh 
and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. On that day of Pentecost, those, those believers were waiting for the promise of the Father. They were in that upper room, and the fire of God fell in that upper room. They were all in one mind and one accord, and they were baptized in the Holy Ghost. They began speaking with different tongues, and Peter stood up, and he preached that day, and he announced that what was happening was exactly what Joel had talked about would happen in the last days. And I want you to know that God is still pouring out his Holy Spirit in these last days that we're living in, that God is still moving what God began on that day in the day of Pentecost and began pouring out his Holy Spirit. He's still doing it for the church today. He's still enduing us with power from from on high in order that we can testify of his goodness and testify of his glory and serve him in the fullness of his plan for our life. God is still doing that in these last days, the days that we're living in. Let's take another look at what the Apostle John has to say about it. I believe Paul wrote Hebrews. We've heard from Paul, we've heard from Peter. Let's see what the Apostle John has to say about it. First John chapter two, verse 18. Little children, it is the last time. A little different there. Almost more urgency, doesn't it sound like it? It is the last time, and as you've heard, that that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. So John says it, I believe, a little different, but he says it is the last time time, and he says, that Antichrist, that's the big one that's going to come at the end we talked about earlier, but he said, even now, when he was writing that, he said, even now, as I'm speaking, there are many Antichrists, those that oppose the things of God, those that oppose Jesus Christ, those that oppose what he's doing, those that oppose him in every way, he said, there are many Antichrists, and by this, we know that it is the last time. So he was saying, and, and you know, honestly, church, that's, that's still happening today. There are many antichrists right now, people that oppose the gospel. They oppose the word of God. They oppose the fact that you even gathered in this church this morning to serve Jesus Christ. There are many antichrists in the world today. And John says, because of this, the big one hasn't showed up. Of course, he's a little one, but the big one hasn't showed up. But there are many just like him that's the spirit of Antichrist working in the world today. And he says it is the last time. I believe that the devil has always had somebody waiting in the wing throughout history because he doesn't know when the Lord's going to come. You think of someone like Adolf Hitler that killed six million Jews, I believe it was, during that time. And uh, I believe that that was one of the ones that was waiting in the wing just for a time to step in if need be. Now, let's take one more look in terms we're looking at the last days. Let's look at, again, what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. Listen to what Peter says. But the end of all things is at hand. Could you be any more blunt, Peter? He had a knack for that. But the end of all things is at hand. Be you therefore sober and watch unto prayer, and above all things have fervent charity or love among yourselves, for charity, that is love, shall cover the multitude of sin. So Peter just comes right out, and he says, the end of all things is at hand. He said, it's, it's here. The end of all things is at hand, so you need to be sober. You need to be loving each other. You need to be caring for each other. Church, listen this morning. You need to be loving each other. You don't need to be holding grudges against each other. You don't need to be fighting against one another. Peter says, the end is at hand. Be sober, be vigilant, and love each other because love will cover a multitude of sins. You're not any better than anybody else. And Peter says, you need to love each other because they're just as bad as you are. And if you don't think so, you're worse than they are. So, what do we make of this? I asked the question, are we living in the last days? And we've looked at scripture from Paul. We've looked at scripture from John. We've looked at scripture from Peter. And they all say we're living in the last days and the last time 
And they come right out and say, and Peter says, look, the end of all things is at hand. And here's what I want to point out by way of this. Living in the expectancy of Jesus' return is nothing new. It's nothing new. There'll be people that try to tell you today, there'll be people that try to say, well, this idea that the church is going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, it's something that people concocted just within the last couple hundred years, and you don't need to worry about that. That's not really, I'm here to tell you this morning that it's as old as the Bible is. The catching away of the church of Jesus Christ was spoken about by the apostles over and over again. I want you to know that Jesus himself said in John chapter 14, he said, if I go away. I will come again to receive you to myself to where I am. You may be also. Not only did Jesus talk about his coming, but also the angels that stood by when Jesus ascended into heaven. Dad talked about the apostles were standing there with their mouths open because Jesus has just ascended into heaven. And the angel stood by and said, why do you stand by gazing up into the heavens? This same Jesus who ascended will come again in like manner as you've seen him go. From that moment on, we're not everyone that was there that time expecting the imminent return of Jesus Christ. If that doesn't make you look for it, I don't know what will. <laughs> I mean, come on. So here's what I want to say. If the apostles, and we've heard from them, have we not? If they were li said we're living in the last days 2,000 years ago, mind you, if they said we're living in the last days 2,000 years ago, then surely we're in the last moments of the last times of the last days, and at any moment, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven and take his church home to be with him. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It's not, it's not speculation. It's a matter of fact. It's what the Bible says. I can't, I can't twist it in any other direction. We've read through the scriptures. We've seen exactly what they say. And if you use your brain, you're going to say, yeah, 2,000 years ago, they expected Christ to come back. So that means that us in this day should also be expecting Christ to return. Now, let me make a, a distinction here. Well, let me say this first. The question, so I guess the question really is not, are we living in the last days? The, the, the question you want to know is how far along are we? See, that's what you really want to know. Because we've seen that we are in the last days, the time between the first coming and the second coming. We've established that. So how, how far along in that process are we? Well, I can tell you one thing. We're closer than we've ever been. That's for sure. You said, duh. Watch it. The answer is, I don't know. Only the Father knows when the Lord's coming back. But here's a, clarif a clarification I need to make. There's a difference between the rapture and the second coming. In the rapture, and, and some of you don't know this, and I want to make it very clear, the rapture of the church is when we are caught up to meet the Lord in the air, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Jesus never touches down at that time. It says the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet them in the clouds in the air, and so shall we be ever be with the Lord. And that's a comfort for his church. So there's a difference between the rapture and the second coming. The rapture is going to happen. We're going up to meet him. He's not touching down yet at that time. We're going up. It's, it never says he touches down at that point. The church comes up to him to meet the Lord in the air. The second coming, however, like we said, every eye is going to see him. The nations are going to see him. It's going to be what they call the glorious appearing of Jesus, and he is going to touch down on the Mount of Olives, just the same place he went up and ascended into heaven, he is going to touch down, and it's going to be obvious when he shows up. So there's a clarification there. Does that make sense to everybody? Don't want to lose anybody along the way. So we're going up to meet him at the rapture. He's touching down at the second coming. I heard one pastor give the analogy like this, and I thought it, it makes a lot of sense. Well, really, and I, I, let me say this too, the, the rapture is a signless event. We're not waiting for anything. 
I want to be clear about that too. We're not waiting for anything to happen. The Lord, this moment, could come back. The second coming is going to cast some shadows. We're going to see things that are happening as we're leading up to it. There will be indications of his return coming in the second coming, but the rapture could happen at any minute. One, uh, one minister spoke about it like this. He said, at Christmas time, you see the Christmas trees come out and the presents and the advertisements and the stores are going on about it. And there's all these different things and people are getting ready for it. Seems like as soon as January 31st hits, they start putting out Christmas stuff again already. Every, uh, but you see that Thanksgiving doesn't really have that. It just, everybody knows about it and it's there. And so he said, when you begin to see the Christmas trees and the presents and the advertisements and, and all of these things, you know that Thanksgiving could be at any moment. <laughs> and that's the way it is, right? The second coming, there will be signs and things that are happening and all this stuff that's going on. But the Lord's return is going to happen at some point, and it's going to be immediate, and all the church is going to know it. <laughs> We're going to be with him. Amen? But I thought that's a good way to put it, you know? Uh, now, one more thing by way of this. So we've determined that we are living in the last days. We know the difference between the rapture and the second coming of Jesus Christ, Thanksgiving and Christmas. That's all some of you will remember today. And now I want to talk about one other thing that I think points us in the direction of how far along are we. Because remember, that's what we want to know. You say, come on, dude, get with it. That's what we want to know about. How far along are we? Well, one thing I want to point out is that Israel is going to be the focal point in the last days and in the end. Israel will be. In 70 AD, many of you know, Titus, a Roman, came in and destroyed the temple, destroyed the city. Every stone was thrown down from the temple, and the city was leveled, and Israel was scattered throughout all the nations around the world, 70 AD. Israel became a wasteland. Jesus prophesied about that actually 37 years before it happened. He said that not one stone would be upon another at the temple, that they would all be cast down. And it seemed ridiculous to him at the time to think that that could happen. The stones were massive. I don't have the measurements on them, but you can look it up. The stones in the temple themselves were massive. And uh, when that happened, it became a wasteland. And in fact, Mark Twain visited the land of Israel in 1867. That was 1,797 years after Titus. And he wrote about it in a trip called Innocence, in a, in a book called Innocence Abroad. Mark Twain, uh, Samuel Clemens, I believe is his actual name. But anyway, he, this is what he wrote when he visited the land of Israel in 1867, almost 1,800 years after Titus. He says, it's a desolate country whose soil is rich enough but given over wholly to weeds, a silent, mournful expanse, a desolation we never saw a human being on the whole route, hardly a tree or a shrub anywhere, even the olive tree and the cactus, those fast friends of a worthless soil, had almost deserted the country. That was his eyewitness account of going to Israel. To him, Israel appeared to be a wasteland, a lost cause, a hopeless desolation, most people would have written them off forever. 1,800 years later after they've been sacked and there's nothing there really. And he wrote about that. But God had not forgotten Israel. God has never forgotten his people. God has never, even if 1,800 years elapse, God has not forgotten his people. See, there's a, a prophecy over in Ezekiel chapter 36 in verse 24, and I'm going to read that for you. It says, For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Notice that word that it says, out of all countries. See, at the time that Ezekiel wrote this prophecy, uh, prophecy he was in, they were in exile in Babylon. 
And not only was God going to bring his people out of Babylon, but notice that it says out of all countries. That word literally means out of the earth, out of the whole world he was going to bring, out of the nations, his people. So not only did God bring his people out of Babylon way back thousands of years ago in Ezekiel's day, but God is bringing his people back into Israel in this day. I want you to know that, that God, and, and though, though the prophecy, uh, well, I'll, I'll get to that just in, in a moment, but let me, let me say this first. There's been a significant event related to this within the last 100 years, and that is the rebirth of the nation of Israel. May the 14th, 1948, God did what no one else would have thought possible. After almost 1,900 years of being a desolate wasteland, you heard Mark Twain, he testified to it, Israel became a nation again. The UN officially recognized Israel as a state, and it was Harry Truman that casted the deciding vote at the time. See, God in his divine providence is bringing the nation back. Where? Not out of just Babylon, not out of just Egypt like he'd done in the past, but he's bringing them out of all nations because when Titus scattered them, they wound up everywhere around the world. God is bringing them back by his power, even from the brink of extinction during World War II and the persecution that they faced in that time. He's restoring them as a nation and though still in unbelief, they're still, they still don't recognize Jesus as the Messiah, but God started something, started the fulfillment of this prophecy in Ezekiel. He's bringing them back, and it's going to know its full fulfillment within the, the time of the millennium. It's really going to know because the next verses talk about God is going to give them a new heart and a new spirit and put his, his uh, he's going to cleanse them. So right now, they're still in unbelief, but they're coming in. They're coming in from all over the world because God is doing it, because God has declared it thousands of years in advance that he's going to bring his people home and he is doing that even within our lifetime. Hallelujah. As of May the 1st, 2022, there's 9.5 million people living in Israel. Of those 9.5 million, over 7 million of them are Jews. The population in 1948 was barely over 800,000. What do you think about that? I think that's pretty awesome. God's bringing them home, and more and more every year. When you look at prophecy in the Bible, doesn't that just get you excited? If you, if you don't believe the, the Bible, if you don't believe, when you see things like this, you have to just be saying, whoa, something's going on. No other nation has come back after being gone that long. But Israel has because God is on their side. So you say, well, why does it matter? Why does it matter? We're talking about the last days. We're talking about how far along we are in the last days. Why does that matter? Well, it matters because in order for the events in the last days to take place, Israel needs to be a nation. See, the second coming of Christ, we know what that is, is preceded by a seven-year tribulation. And... It's also known as the time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week, if you've heard those terms. When the church is caught away, the Antichrist will be revealed. And it says in Daniel chapter 9 that he's going to confirm a covenant with Israel for one week. And you know what? It's with Israel. And he's going, there's going to be a temple that's built where? In Israel. And there's going to be a sacrifice, it resumes, in that temple in Israel and three and a half time, years from the time uh, of this covenant, he's going to turn on Israel and begin to persecute them and declare himself to be God. So are you catching a theme here that Israel has something to do with the end times according to Daniel and the book of Revelation? All of that comes together. So if you don't have Israel, how are you going to have a temple and how are you going to have a sacrifice and how are you going to have the Antichrist fighting against Israel? How are you going to have all these things if you don't have Israel? So God said, no problem. 2,000 years later, here's Israel. Doesn't that tell you how close we are? 
They even have many of the articles ready for that temple. It's all done. The, the things that they're going to use in that temple, they just haven't built it yet. So God is getting everything ready. Can you see that? God is getting everything ready. The end of all things is at hand, just like Peter said. And in the moment, uh, the church could be caught away, and this world is going to go into great tribulation, such as the world has never known. So with that being said, I, I hope you see Maybe we're right there at the end. We've talked about the last days and kind of where we are in terms of the last days. And so in light of all these things, how are we supposed to live in the last days? I think we all agree that's where we're at now, right? The last days. How are we supposed to live in the last days? Are there dangers associated with the last days? And uh, well, let's look at a couple of those. So first of all, I want to say that there is the, the peril of the times. Number one, the peril of the times, the danger of the times. Now, the time before Christ's return, Jesus said, will be like the days of Noah and like the days of Lot. And in that time, people are going to be living for themselves as if God does not exist. We've heard from all these other guys. Let's hear from Jesus now in Luke 17, verses 26 through 30. Listen to what he says about the last days. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. This is what we're talking about. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Notice that they were talking eating and drinking and getting married and giving in marriage until the day. Uh, None of those things are necessarily wrong, but the idea in this is that the people were living as if God didn't exist in an hour of impending judgment. While Noah was building the ark, he was preaching for 120 years, and it was a warning to the people of his day, saying judgment is coming. God is going to bring judgment. The people in Sodom and Gomorrah, they were going on about their lives. They were living as if nothing mattered. They were so wholly given over to their, their sins and their, and their wickedness that they really didn't care about God or what God had to say. And all the while, impending judgment was hanging over their head, and it says, until the day judgment came in Noah's day. And the same day that Lot went out of the city, the fire rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah and brought judgment on, on them all. They were living as though nothing mattered, living as if God didn't matter. And we see the same spirit in this age. All the while, we know we're living in the last days. The preaching has been going on for years and years. We see things that are happening. And all the while, people are saying, God doesn't matter. He's second. I'll write him off. It doesn't matter. I've got things to do. I've got places to go. He's not the important thing in my life. All the while, they don't know. But judgment suddenly is hanging over their head for all those that forget God and want nothing to do it. And in a moment, it could come upon them and take them unawares just like it did in Noah's day and in Lot's day in Sodom and Gomorrah. It's a sad place to be, but my prayer to the Lord is, I don't want the spirit of this age. I want your Holy Spirit. And that should be the prayer of your heart. God, don't let me be of the spirit of this age that leaves you out and forgets you and doesn't care about you, give me your Holy Spirit, that I'll be ready, that I'll be one of those safe in the ark when the judgment comes, that I'll be one of those taken out before the wrath of God is poured out on this planet. Oh, God, give me your Holy Spirit. Now, turn in your Bibles to Matthew 24, and this is where you can leave it pinned open. I will reference a few other places, and I'm going to move along a little quicker here. But you can leave it open in Matthew 24. Now, the course of history has been marked by many perilous, difficult, and dangerous times. But in the last of the last days, which I believe we're living in now, the last of the last days, 
uh, difficulties are going to intensify. They're going to get worse and worse. There are going to be more sorrows and, and pain and natural disasters and famines and difficulties and diseases and violence and all sorts of perverse sinfulness is going to happen. And these are all things that have marked the course of history. This, these things are not anything new, but in the last of the last days, they're going to get worse and more pronounced. So in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is going to peer down the tunnel of time, and he's going to give his disciples an overview of the things that are going to happen, the course of history, and in the, in the future, leading up to his second coming. And Jesus is going to give some information about things that are going to be happening. So let's look at verse 1 and 2 of Matthew chapter 24. It says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and that's not to return. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. They were impressed by their religious institution there. Uh, another account says that they were showing off the stones of the temple, how amazing they were. And Jesus said unto them, See you not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be one, be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Remember I talked about earlier that Titus came in 70 AD. And they say that actually when he came into the city uh, that he actually cut down the olive trees out of the Mount of Olives. And the natural oil, he piled them inside and outside. And they, uh, some say that he built scaffolding around the temple. And the natural oil from the olive trees acted as an accelerant to make the fire even hotter. They lit the building on fire. The temple was, was, uh, had lots of gold ornaments inside and outside. And the fire became so hot that the gold melted and ran down in the cracks of the stones and all throughout the temple. So when it was done, they came back to pick through the rubble and to loot the town, so to speak. And they went and they picked apart every single stone of the temple, stone by stone, and they've actually found some that have been thrown over the side of, uh, of the mountain there that were stones that were taken out of the temple and thrown away because they were going and looking for all the gold that had melted and ran down in those stones. How incredible is that? Jesus said these some 37 years before, not one stone is going to remain upon another. And he went through, they went through and turned every stone every one of them, and not one stone remained upon another. Wow. I'd say Jesus had some inside information. <laughs> God information. No one could have known that. Titus didn't know that he would do that. God knew. See, Jesus was telling about that judgment. Now, let's look at verses 3 through 8. We're going to see a course of history here. It's going to be an overview. I want you to see what he says. Matthew 24, verses 3 through 8. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, When shall these things be? When's all this stuff going to happen? And, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, more or less, when you're going to set up your kingdom and come to stay? And the end of the world, or the end of the age, and Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all of these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All of these things are the beginning of sorrows. So we've seen all these things throughout the course of history. We've seen wars and rumors of wars. We, we have that happening today. Everybody, I don't have to tell you that there's tensions between the U.S. and China and the U.S. and Russia and nations all over the world. There's tensions, there's wars, there's rumors of war, the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. I mean, you could just pull the headlines and see that these things are happening in the course of history. But what he says there in verse 8, all these things, 
things are the beginning of sorrows. He's literally saying they're, they're birth pains. They're, they're like labor pains. He's saying they're going to start out and they're going to be sparse. They're going to, they're going to be some time between them, but, but they're going to intensify and they're going to become more pronounced and closer together and stronger and stronger and stronger throughout the course of history, ultimately ending up in the culmination. So the frequency of these things is what he's saying. It's going to get worse and worse, stronger and stronger until they culminate in maximum intensity in, maximum intensity in the great tribulation. So that's what's going to happen. So, so we're seeing some of these things because yes, it's part of history, but it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like a siren that's getting louder and louder and louder and louder and louder until finally it's blaring loud. It's at the maximum intensity during the great tribulation time. So we're seeing these things happening now, but there's, but they're going to get worse. They're not going to get better. They're actually going to get worse. And you're saying that's so encouraging. I know. Look at verse uh, nine. We're going to talk about the peril of man. That is intense, increased persecution. Verse nine, then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted. They shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my sake. Make no mistake, the last days are going to be a time of increased persecution against Christian people. We're quickly seeing an escalation of God-hating people. They hate the Bible. They, they hate the things of God. And the persecution is already happening around the world at an extreme rate uh, that, you wouldn't, that you wouldn't believe until you actually hear what's happening. Let me give you a few uh, statistics about that. According to Open Doors USA, which is an organization that deals with the persecuted church around the world, they release a report, a world watch list every year. In 2022, this is what they had to say, and this is just in a year, in the last year, 2022, uh, which probably takes in some of 21 also, depending on their reporting, but... They said over 360 million Christians are living in places facing high levels of persecution and discrimination. That's one in seven believers worldwide. 5,898 Christians killed for their faith. This is in one year. 5,110 churches and other buildings attacked, 6,175 believers detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, or imprisoned, 3,829 Christians abducted. Uh, they also reported that a Christian is killed every two hours in Nigeria for their faith. Another report that I read said more Christians have died in the 20th century, and no doubt adding the 21st in that as well, than all of the previous centuries combined. Increased persecution. The danger of the time. The danger of the time is simply that we live in the time that we live. Not only that, but increased persecution. The peril of man. Because they said, you know, Paul said, it, we're in perilous times. Uh, the last days, perilous times shall come. I want you to know this also, that the word perilous is the same word used of the demoniac of Gadara. It's the Greek word chalepos. Remember the demoniac of Gadara? The Bible calls him in Matthew that he was exceeding fierce. He was demon-possessed. He lived among the tombs. Uh, day and night he was screaming. He was cutting himself. He could not be bound with chains. They tried to bind him. They tried to tame him, and nothing could be done. And that same word, chalepos, is used in the last days. Chalepos, time shall come. Exceeding fierce times shall come. And I think a particular danger of the hour that we live in is the peril of man, the danger of man, that this is an hour of increased persecution. Paul goes on in, in uh, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, and he talks about all these things. I'm not going to read the list for the sake of time, but if you read that first uh, section of scripture in Timothy chapter 3, he gives a whole laundry list of terrible things about people and how they're going to live in this last time, how they're going to be disobedient 
disobedient and blasphemers and God haters and, and uh, fierce and despisers of those that are good. He goes through all those things. These men that are living in this time, he says they're fully depraved. He says that they have the appearance of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. He says they're phonies, they're creeps. They lead people astray. They reach in to people's homes and try to lead them astray. They take advantage of them. They oppose the truth. They, they, what they are is they're tares among God's people. They're tares among the weed, as the Bible talks about. And God's judgment is coming for the God-haters of this world, for the persecutors of this world, for those that are killing his people and murdering them every day. God's judgment is coming for those people. But in the meantime, they're getting worse and worse is what the Bible says. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Listen. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Let me say to you, church, the peril of the time that we're living in is also the peril of man. The danger of the men and women that are living in this hour that we're living in right now. It's happening. It's coming to a town near you, I think, too. Even as we sometimes complain about the way things are going, but we have it very, very good here in the United States. We are blessed beyond measure. You heard what other people are dealing with. But we've got to remain faithful. I remember, I remember Jesus said, fear not him that can destroy the body but fear him that can destroy the body and the soul in hell. When you're fearing Christ, when you're fearing God, the godly fear, you don't have to fear any man. Moving right along, the peril of offense. The peril of offense. Look at verses 8 through 10 again. All of these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Notice it says many shall be offended. That doesn't mean all. You don't have to be one of those that become offended. Many shall be offended. See, God moves according to his will, his way, and his time. God will do his will, his way, and his time, not according to our expectation. See, what's going to happen, there's going to be many people in the last days that when they'll have an expectation of what God should do, how he should move, the way he should go about it. And when he doesn't do it their way, according to the their time, how they think it ought to go, then they're going to become offended at God and say, God, why didn't you do it the way I thought it should be done? Because I know so much better. Right? That's the, that's the attitude that people are going to have. People are going to become offended, literally offended. They're going to leave. They're going to abandon God, say, well, I've had enough of you because what I thought you should do, you didn't do it. And so I'm out. That's a danger of the time we live, that people are going to become offended. Jesus said, remember, if they persecuted me, they're also going to persecute you. That's what he says in John 15. Jesus warned about the persecution that we would face. He warned about the difficult times. He endured these things. He went through these things. And uh, what I'm saying to you this morning is don't become offended with God when God doesn't do something you think he ought to do in the way that he ought to do it. He is our help. He is our strength. He is our hope. He is our song. He is our light in a dark world. He's the one we run to. He's not the one that we should be angry at because if we're going to get mad at God, who can we go to? Don't become offended at God. Say, God, why are you doing things this way? John chapter 16, verse 1, Jesus says, These things have I spoken unto you that you should not be, what? Offended. He goes on to talk about persecution in that chapter, actually. So John was, well, let me say this. If we're not careful, we can get a little, we can get discouraged, we can become depressed, and if we're not careful, the enemy will sneak in and try, try to get you to say, well, God should have done something different. If God was what he should be, then I wouldn't be going through this. I wouldn't be dealing with these things. It's a danger of the hour we live in, actually. 
I'm reminded of John the Baptist. Remember John the Baptist? The greatest prophet, Jesus said. A burning and a shining light. He was the one that baptized Jesus in the Jordan River. And God said, this is my beloved son from the heavens in whom I am well pleased. He saw the spirit descending upon him and remaining upon the son of God. John the Baptist said, behold the lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. He declared, this is him. He was at ground zero with all of these things. But he found himself in prison for preaching the truth to a dirty old man named Herod. And in that prison, he began to languish away. He was, he was in there for a long time, and he began to become despairing and discouraged, so much to the point that he sent two of his disciples to Jesus with a question. And their question was, are you he, or should we look for another? No doubt John thought probably like many of the people in his day that when the Messiah came, he would set up his kingdom, topple Rome, and come into power. But John sees Jesus going about doing good, sees him going about doing all these good things, but he doesn't see a kingdom being set up, and he's still sitting in jail, wasting away, and he just, he's depressed, and he's discouraged. God, what I thought you were going to do, you haven't done yet. So he sends out these two guys, his two disciples, and, and they go and look, and, and Jesus says, go and tell John to look again, basically is what Jesus says. He says, go again and show John the things that you see. He said, the blind have their eyes open, the deaf hear, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the dead are raised to life, and blessed is he who's not offended in me. Hallelujah. That's in Matthew eleven six, 6, and blessed is he who's not offended in me. So John seen those things. He took another look. He took another look. It was all he needed. Those disciples went. They were question marks when they went. Is this he? They came back as exclamation points. You, you believe what we've seen just now? What God is doing? They came back with the credentials of the king. These are the things the king would do, and John knew it. It's what the Old Testament prophets told about that he would do, and it was all John needed, and he went and he gave his life for the cause of Christ. He wasn't offended. He said, I'll take that blessing. Blessed is he who's not offended in me. In whatever circumstance you find yourself, listen, church, in whatever place you find yourself, remember the words of Jesus. Blessed is he who's not offended in me. In whatever circumstance, even if you thought it should go one way and it went completely the opposite way, in whatever case you find yourself this morning, the words from Jesus come back to you again and say, take another look at where you've been. Take another look at where you come from. Take another look at what God's done in your life. Take another look and realize that all along, regardless of where you find yourself, God is at work. Don't be offended at him. Trust that he knows best. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Last, not last, but almost last. And I know you're saying, come on, get with it. Almost finished here. The danger of diminished love. The danger of diminished love. Verses 11 and 12. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. We see that all over the land. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Jesus said these false prophets are going to rise, they're going to deceive, they're going to come in many shapes and forms. They're going to offer another gospel, another Jesus. I believe they're even going to use offense, people that become offended as a springboard to give them another gospel and another Jesus that's more palatable to them, that's going to work for them. Because the Bible says that in the last days they're going to heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They're going to, what's going to happen is they're going to go and praise the teachers. Oh, you're so wonderful. And the teachers are going to praise them. Oh, you're so wonderful. And they're going to fulfill their own lusts upon each other. And it'll have nothing to do with God. And those teachers are going to take advantage of the people that fall for it. 
But Jesus says, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. The reason of the cold love is because iniquity shall abound. Do we not see that today? That the world is getting so perverse, so wicked, so hateful, so undesirable that people, when we see them, they're beginning to look unlovable. We're going to start looking at them and say, well, I can't love them. Those people are unlovable. They're ridiculous. Oh, Jesus gave a warning about that. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. In fact, Jesus said, my commandment is that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, and that a man lay down his life for his friends. See, Jesus gave a command to love. He gave a command. See, love is, uh, he gave the command to love, and it's a choice. We can choose to love people. And when we love people, it will be a motivator. See, Jesus chose to love us. We were enemies with God. We, we were at odds with God. We, we hated him in many cases, and yet Jesus chose to love us. Us, and he chose to give him his life for us. And he laid down his life and demonstrated the greatest love of all, which is the sacrificial love. Greater love is no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. He gave us that command, and love is going to motivate you to do things that you wouldn't think you would ever do for people that you wouldn't think you would ever do them for. Remember that demoniac? He was hateful. He was vile. He was wicked. He was unlovable. He was uh, dangerous. He was fierce. He was so uh, the opposite of anyone you would ever want to come in contact with, and yet Jesus loved that man. He went to him, and he saved him. And Jesus gave us that command that we're to love as he loves. Last, and you say, praise God, it goes along with exactly that, the peril of giving up or the call to persevere. And you're saying, I've been persevering all morning since you got up there. Are you still with me? Can I finish this? Just going to take a minute, and then we're going to give an invitation. Verse 13, but he that shall endure unto the end, and that doesn't mean the end of this sermon. <laughs> the same shall be saved. He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now, let me say it like this. The enduring is not what causes the saving. The saving is what causes the enduring. You know, it's God's the one that's going to keep you. We're saved by grace, not by works. The one who saved us by his grace is going to keep us by his grace. The Bible says that what he begins in us, he will perform until the day of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that he's not going to forsake the work of his own hands. What he begins in a life, he will perform it. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So what is our takeaways for today? Well, recognize we, the hour we live in. Seek the Lord for grace in coming persecution. Don't be offended. Settle in your heart that God knows best. Ask God for more love and choose to love the unlovable. And finally, believe God for grace to be faithful to the end. There are some of you in this place that um, you don't know the Lord. And you're in the worst place of anybody because you have no hope. It all gets worse from here. So my advice to you, and with all of my heart, is that you, in a sincere heart of repentance, would turn to Jesus Christ Confess your sins. Ask that God would forgive you and change you, and he will do it on the authority of his word. Realize he died for you, rose again from the grave, and if you'll trust him with your life, he'll give you that life. If you missed any of today's broadcast, would like to watch it again, or maybe share it with your friends, you can do that easily by heading over to our YouTube channel. Simply go to www.youtube.com forward slash Ozark Full Gospel Church. You'll find today's broadcast as well as many other great messages. 
While you're there, be sure to click that red subscribe button to stay up to date with all of our latest videos. It's totally free and a great way to stay connected with us.